If you're visiting with us today, you came on a very special day. We are so honored to have an Orthodox rabbi bring the word. Amen. Amen. Pesach Wiliki lives in Israel, and he just happened to have scheduled Generations Church on a day like today. So you hear more about what's happening there. But he's going to bring us a word on gender and marriage, and it's going to be good. So open your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Come right on, Rabbi. Show him some love. Thank you very much, Pastor. And thank you so much for opening your home. I know this is... Uh, who's here in this church for the first time? A few people here. Um, if you come back next week, things will be back to normal. <laughs> you know, you, don't, you show up in a church for the first time and there's a Jewish rabbi <laughs> giving the message. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> we, we won't tell anyone, Pastor. It's okay. So come back next week. Everything will be just fine. Uh, but thank you. Thank you so much for opening your, for opening your hearts, opening your home. And, uh, and thank you to Ann and John, Stacy, for, uh, for doing so much for Israel and so much for me and, and, for, uh, and for the work that we do at Israel 365. Uh, thank you. So before I get to uh, the topic that the pastor mentioned, talking about one of the major spiritual warfare battlefields that we're involved in, about gender and marriage, which is so under attack. Uh, I can't stand up here this morning and not mention uh, what happened yesterday. Uh, Hopefully, uh, if you've been paying attention at all to the headlines, you know that Iran, the mortal enemy of Israel, funds the the various enemies around us, like Hezbollah and Hamas, Iran, who vows to take down the great Satan, America, and the, and the small Satan, Israel, calls for death to America. Iran launched over 100 ballistic missiles at Israel and a swarm of, of military drones at Israel yesterday. They were all but one intercepted on the way. So God really, you know, aided us and protected us. Amen. Thank you. And uh, my wife sent me a video. Can, you, can we see this video? My wife sent this to me. It's a Twitter post of a neighbor of mine. We have a neighbor who has a big Twitter following, and she posted a video on her Twitter feed. My wife was sitting in the bomb shelter back home. Do we have this? Here, this is a... Oh, my God. Okay. What you're seeing there, you, you, those lights in the sky, why don't you hit pause oh on the God. video there? The lights you're seeing in the sky are missiles and drones being intercepted. The building in the foreground is my home. So that was what I woke up to today. My wife's like, hey, look at this. This is our, this is our house. I'm like, okay, all right. Um, look, folks, Ecclesiastes, very famous passage in Ecclesiastes, maybe the most famous passage in Ecclesiastes, talks about how there's a time for everything, right? There's a time for gathering stones and a time for throwing stones, a time to build and a time to destroy, right? You know that passage? The last line of that passage says there's a time for war and a time for peace. And it sounds like the simplest passage. It sounds almost like a nursery rhyme. There's a time for love and a time for hate and a time to, right? A time for all things. It sounds like the simplest verse in the Bible. A time for war and a time for peace. But folks, it's a very, very difficult verse. It's actually a very challenging verse. Because that verse was not written to two different people. That verse, like every verse in the Bible, is written to every one of us. And when the Bible says there's a time for war and a time for peace... What the Bible is telling us is that we must know what time it is. And if it is a time for war, and we think that it's a time for peace, and we treat it like a time for peace, but it's actually a time for war, we are going to make grave, grave mistakes. 
The reverse is also true. If it's a time for peace and we treat it like a time for war, and I know a few people like that, We'll also make some mistakes, but this is a very difficult thing because this is what the Bible's saying is that you have to make that switch. You have to make that pivot. Because whether it's a time for peace and a time or a time for war, we don't get to choose. Our enemies have a say in that. And there is a time for war and there is a time for peace. And as I said, we must know what time it is. We must make that switch. We must make that pivot. And in Israel, we've made that pivot. We've absolutely made that pivot. Someone I was talking to earlier today talked about how, you know, I showed that video. <laughs> so I was kind of freaked out. You know, this is my host. You know. My wife was calm, by the way. Oh, how's people? You know, I showed some of the video. How's your wife doing? Oh, she's fine. My wife's a tough lady. Her attitude is, you know, God's going to take me at some point, you know. Would I rather be anywhere but Israel? We're not nervous. I've, I have three kids, well, two of my sons and my son-in-law, who've been fighting in Gaza pretty much since October 7th. You know what's not in that list in Ecclesiastes? Time for love, time for hate, time to build, time to destroy, time to, time to laugh, time to weep, right? You know what's not in the list? does not say there's a time to fear. It's not in the list. There's no time to fear. Because fear is the opposite of faith. Fear, let me say that again. Fear is the opposite of faith. There is no time for fear. And when you embrace the fact that it's a time for war, you know what happens? Your fear goes away. Right. But that war, you know, the war we're fighting in Israel, the war my children are fighting, we would be making a grave mistake. And here I'm speaking to you. I live in Israel. Like I said, my kids are fighting. We make a grave mistake if we think that it's about, it's about Israel. And that, you know, do I support Israel? Do I stand with Israel? And I'll illustrate the point. I know I want to get to my main teaching, but just a couple more minutes on this. It, it, I, I did not plan to talk about this this morning, but I can't not say something. You know, we, here we are. <laughs> literally, Iran attacked us yesterday. And I'm, I'm in church this morning. It's a very tough time to be away from home, by the way. I'd much rather be in Israel right now. November 29th, right after Thanksgiving, in New York City, there was a riot that took place at the annual Christmas tree lighting ceremony at Rockefeller Plaza. In New York City at Rockefeller Plaza every year, they put up this massive Christmas tree and they light it up and people come with their families and it's a whole event. It's the kickoff to the Christmas shopping season. And pro-Hamas, anti-Israel demonstrators showed up. They were screaming slogans like, long live the Intifada, from the river to the sea, and Christmas is canceled. And a similar, and, and they caused a riot. They, they turned the whole Christmas tree lighting ceremony into a violent riot and destroyed the experience. And there were similar events in London where pro-Hamas protesters were protesting the Christmas shopping season on Oxford Street and Piccadilly Circus. And in Italy, at the La Scala Opera, where for decades and decades, or maybe longer, there's been an annual Christmas opera that goes on at the La Scala Opera, it was interrupted by pro-Hamas demonstrators. Now, for fear of stating the obvious, let me point out that Jews don't celebrate Christmas. <laughs> why on earth does it make sense? Why on earth does it make sense to the enemies of Israel to protest Christmas in the name of being against Israel? Jews don't celebrate Christmas. Israel has a 2% Christian minority. 
Why did they do that? Why did it make sense to them? Ask yourself that question. Because it made sense to them. To them, it made perfect sense. Like I said, it wasn't an isolated incident all over the world. Christmas being protested in the name of being anti-Israel. So instead of laughing at how silly that is, let's think about what they're saying to you. And what our enemies are saying to you, who do celebrate Christmas, is that Israel's war is your war. Our enemies are saying that. And there are too many people in this country, too many Christians in this country, who have not gotten the message. We are at war. Israel's fighting it kinetically. But when I see college campuses in America where the majority of students are screaming these anti-Israel slogans, I say, you know what? The jihadists that we're fighting kinetically are taking over your children without firing a shot. And we better wake up. Because this is all one war. And part of that war, as evidenced by the remarkable Queers for Palestine group, (laughs) because one of the most amazing things, but again, it's our enemies talking to us. It makes sense to them. We can laugh at them, but it makes sense to them. If you find someone who believes that there's no such thing as men and women, and that gender is a choice, And that men can menstruate. If you find someone who believes that, who pushes that sick ideology, strangely enough, nine times out of ten, they support Hamas. Figure that one out. Because it's all the same war. Because it's all the same war. I'd like to pivot now. I, I, you know, I spend a lot of my time talking about what's going on in Israel. As you could imagine, it's kind of what I do for a living. So, but when your pastor and I were talking last week, we were talking about what's going to happen here this Sunday morning, and he said, you know, I'd really like you to talk about the issues we're dealing with, about gender. And I was like, oh, I breathed like a sigh of relief. He thought he was like, you know, you know squeezing me, like I want to talk about the war. I, don't, I, I talk about the war all day. I'd much rather do a Bible study about men and women and marriage and get some clarity from the Bible. But let's also remember in the backdrop, this is all the same war. This is all the same war. There's people who see good and evil clearly the way we do. And there's people who everything is flipped around. Evil is good. Good is evil. And that's what we're battling. So let's get into the scriptures. Let's... uh, talk about one of the shared values that we have that are under attack. And by the way, I'm not here to, uh, to uh, you know, make you less Christian or Jewish. There's not going to be like a Jewish altar call at the end of this. <laughs> you know, I'm just, uh, look, <laughs> I'll put it this way. You know, if I come home at the end of the day and my wife says to me, honey, we need to speak about our relationship. So I'm worried. Something's wrong. Right? Honey, we have to talk about our relationship. You see, because when things are good, you don't talk about the relationship. You just live in the relationship. Right? So I didn't come here today to talk about our relationship. I came here today to live in the relationship. And that relationship revolves around scripture, around shared scripture. We have our differences and we know what they are. That's fine. But in this time and in this place, where we are in history... We need to come together around what we share. When we're done dealing with the enemy, we can work out our differences. We can have that fight. But let's, let's focus on what we share today. So one of those eternal values that is under attack right now is the sanctity of marriage. And I'll be doing some reading here because I worked out my notes very carefully. Don't worry, I'm not reading it. I'm just, I'm just reading my own words. It's because when the forces of deception and confusion are riding high out in the world, we turn to God's word for clarity, and for truth, and for guidance. And what, I'll, what I will sh- share with you today 
through a close reading of verses from Genesis 2 and 3, is that we must understand what marriage, what the relationship of man and woman is meant to be. And by understanding that relationship biblically, we will understand our responsibilities to God and creation as well. So let's pay close attention. Let's pay close attention to the sequence of the verses that introduce the relationship of man and woman. We'll start with Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, which is right before the creation of woman. Where God basically states what man's purpose is on this earth. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to guard it. To work it and to guard it. Le'ovda u shomra in Hebrew. To work and to guard. Notice it doesn't say to enjoy, to partake of the bounty of this earth. There could have been all sorts of beautiful biblical expressions. No, man's purpose is to work and to guard. To work and to protect. Not to indulge in pleasures. To work means simply that there's work to be done. I have to do something. To work. To be productive. To make things better. To guard or protect means that I must do no harm. I have to protect God's creation. So to work and to guard. In other words, we're on this earth. I'm going to sum up to work and to guard into one word. We're on this earth to be responsible. Only human beings have responsibility. To be responsible means that my life is not fundamentally about me. To be responsible means that I'm accountable. It means that I have a calling. I have a mission. This is man's covenantal responsibility to his creator, to be responsible, to work and to protect. Now, immediately afterward, God commands man regarding the tree of knowledge. This is, again, before the woman comes on the scene. Let's go to the next slide, please. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Keep going. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Now watch carefully here. We're going to read the Bible carefully. For on the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Interesting. We know what happens next, right? Here's a question for you. Don't run me out of church. Was God telling the truth? Oh, of course. Yes, God. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, obedient Christian. Okay, here's a, let me explain the question. Did Adam and Eve die on the day they ate from the tree? Spiritually, they died. Okay, good answer. <laughs> now, they didn't die on the day they ate from the tree. In the Bible, it doesn't say they died. You can, in, in order to resolve the question and make God not a liar, you can say they spiritually died to get out of the problem. But according to the text, they don't die that day. Okay? The Bible doesn't use that term. So what did God mean on the day that you eat of the tree, you shall surely die? So ladies and gentlemen, listen carefully. And if you're, for some reason, if you're spacing out and haven't heard anything I've said till now, this is a good time to pay attention for a few minutes, because this little nugget is, is worthwhile. So if someone next to you is, you know, asleep, wake them up. <laughs> Understanding the answer to this question, what did God mean when he said, on the day that you eat of the tree, you will surely die? Understanding the answer to that question will open us up to understanding everything that comes next about marriage and our task on this earth. God meant, on the day you will eat of it, you shall surely die, plain and simple. Allow me to explain. Each and every one of us is created with a dual identity. We have a body and we have a soul. Right? A physical side and a spiritual side. We live in the physical world of our bodies of flesh and blood. And at the same time as I live in my body, I'm very much aware of the fact that there is another more profound component of who I am, which is my soul. My soul is responsible for my morality, my wisdom, my values, my faith. So my soul is who I really am, right? Right, everyone? Is your soul, your soul is who you really are? So let me ask you a simple question. If you feel that you're really a soul, right, like I have this body, it's like this kind of interesting 
thing that I live in, and it allows me to walk around on this earth and do things, and it's got these cool little things that I can use, right? But, but really, I'm this soul that lives in this, in this vessel, right? And at some point, I'm going to leave this vessel and go on to the next world. But if we really identify with our souls, let me ask a simple question. Don't call out the answer. Are you going to die? Are you going to die? Now, if you answer, yes, I'm going to die, then I have a follow-up question. Are you a body or are you a soul? Now, you might say I'm both, but let me explain what I mean. You see, the soul is eternal. It does not die when it leaves the body. It lives on. The body dies. It's physical. Physical things die. So when I ask you, are you going to die, what I'm asking you is this. Are you a body that has a soul? Or are you a soul that lives in a body? Which one is you? Which one do you identify with? Do you see yourself as a soul and you have this body that you work with and you live with for this time on earth, but you're really a soul? If you really identify that way, then if I asked you, are you going to die? You'd say, no. My body will die, but that's not me. Right? Am I primarily a soul, a spiritual, moral being driven by values and by my relationship with God, and I have a body? Or am I a body whose primary identity is bodily, And of the flesh, and I have a soul. You know, I take it to church on Sunday. It likes music and God. I I feed it what it needs now and then. But really, I'm a body. That's who I really am. Which one is the real me? This is the eternal struggle of humanity since our creation. In the struggle for, it's a struggle for primacy and dominance. Who will win? Who's, Who's really in charge? The body or the soul? So let's get back to God, to what God said to Adam. When God said to Adam, for on the day that you eat from the tree, you will surely die. Here's what he was saying. He was saying, Adam, on the day that you choose your own desires over the expressed will of God, you are choosing the primacy of the body. And if you choose to identify with your body, and that that's primary over the soul, if you choose to give the body and your physical desires the position of authority and the soul is second class, subservient, then you've identified with your body and Adam, bodies die. So the day you choose body over soul, you're saying, I'm a body. And therefore, on that day, you, Mr. Body, have sealed your fate. You will surely die. Oh, your soul? Your soul won't die, but that's not you. Let's move ahead in the text. Keep this idea fresh, and let's move ahead in the text. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. A very difficult phrase to translate. Uh, helper opposite him or matching him. Now, in light of, well, well, let's read the next few verses. The Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam calls each living creature, that will be its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. So God declares that it's not good for man to be alone, that he'll make him a complementary uh, helper, match, a match for him, a mate. So in light of what we just said, what God is saying is that I've just told Adam that he has a body and a soul. 
Now I have to make him understand what that really means. And notice that God doesn't say that man needs a partner for mating or someone to have a good time with. He says he needs a helper. Now, that's this, I told you, it's a very hard phrase to, uh, to translate. Is there can go, a helper opposite him? That's why if you look in Bible Gateway or Bible Hub at the 52 translations of that verse, you'll see a whole bunch of different translations of what, it, what the phrase means. If you see a lot of different translations of a verse, that's where you've got to call a, a rabbi and find out what the Hebrew says, because it means that it's a tough phrase to translate. Now, the Hebrew word here is ezer, which means helper. One needs a helper to assist when one has a task to do. And there's different kinds of helpers in the Bible. An ezer is a partner. Like if two armies go to war together in the Bible, it'll, it'll, talk, it'll use that same word again. Okay, so two people who are, who are partners in a, in a task. Again, this is not someone to hang out with, to frivolously, to frivolously indulge in pleasure with. A partner in the responsibility for God's creation, in the work and protection of God's creation. And here the text make, takes a fascinating term. Look closely at the sequence of verses again. Let's take a look at this. I'm going back. God says, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to give him a mate. I'm going to make him someone, a good mate for him. Very nice. But what's the next verse? The next verse is that out of the ground, God brought every beast of the field and every bird and brought them to Adam so he could name them. Okay. Interesting job to do. And Adam names everything. And at the end of that, it says, but he didn't find a mate. Everyone get that? We have verses that describe man naming all the animals, sandwiched between God saying man needs a mate, and the statement at the end of the third of these three verses saying he didn't find a mate. Okay? Now, what does naming all the animals have to do with Adam needing a mate and needing a wife? Okay, I just want to make this point very clear. The sequence of verses in the Bible at first glance is very strange. Verse number one, not good for man to be alone, let him find a mate. Verse number two, God brings him all the animals to name. Verse number three, he names them and doesn't find a mate. Are we ready to understand this? Is this strange? Here we go. It seems that Adam was dating. He was checking out his options, you see. Adam... It's not good for you to be alone. Let's find you a wife. How about this one? No, that's an elephant. How about that one? No, that's a squirrel. Right? I mean, that, that's what it says here. You notice this? Not good for man to be alone. I've got to make a mate for him. So I'm going to bring him all the animals and all the birds, and he's going to name them all. And when he's done naming them, he goes, whoop, he didn't find a mate. Folks, this is a very, very powerful lesson. This is the Bible describing to us the relationship of man and woman in its beginnings. In this scene, God taught Adam a very powerful lesson. Simply put, man is not an animal. By naming the animals, by naming the animals, Adam declared them to be others, to be outside of him. In naming them, he also declared his primacy over them. Superiors name subordinates. Subordinates do not name their superiors. So through this process, Adam comes to realize that he has no partner in the animal kingdom. He's not an animal. In the words of the text... So Adam gave names to all the cattle and birds of the air but in every beast of the field. But Adam did not find a helper comparable to him in the animal kingdom. He recognized that he's not an animal. Folks, we're being told by a lot of people today that we're just animals. And Adam realized that he's not part of the animal kingdom. He's superior to it. He's there to guard it and protect it and work the world, but it is subservient to him. And that his, mate, his mating is not of the animal kingdom. There is no marriage in the animal kingdom. There's no helpmate or helper comparable to him. 
There is mating in the animal kingdom, but there's no marriage. Animals do not have responsibility. They don't have a task. They don't work and protect God's creation. They are bodies, to go back to what I said before. It is specifically man's search for a partner in responsibility and mission, in ezer, that word I mentioned before, which brings him to the realization that, he ha- that he's not part of the animal kingdom. He has a body, like animals do, but that's not who he is. He is a soul. And once man realizes that he's not an animal, now he's ready for his true partner and mate. You see, he discovered that he's alone. God, God had to bring him to a point where he realized that. And that's what this whole, this whole activity was about. To recognize, to distance himself from the animal kingdom. So let's move on. We all know what happens next. What happens next, and I'm not going to go into the details of that strange medical procedure that God performs in order to create woman out of man's tzela, which is usually translated as rib, although the Hebrew word has multiple translations. The Talmud goes through the multiple translations. You see them in the Bible. And I'm not, this is a whole other Bible study to understand what that word means. It's usually translated as rib because tzela is the word for rib, but it's also the word for side, and it's also... The, uh, and for some other things. It's unclear what exactly the medical procedure was. We can go with rib because that's been accepted traditionally, but it's not clear that that's what the Hebrew word means. It was some, some piece of him was turned into woman. Okay. But then the woman is, is uh, he wakes up from this, uh, he, you know, the anesthetic wears off, and uh, God brings the woman to Adam, and he is just glowing. And the man said, this time, notice that, it says that, Genesis 2, verse 23. This time, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. What a beautiful romantic statement. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And the word bone, etzem, also means essence. Because it's the inside. Bones are in the inside. So it happens to be the same word. So there's a, there's a play on words here that he's saying she's essential, we're part of the same essence. Very nice. What did he mean when he said this time? Again, that goes back to that whole thing with the animals. In other words, now he goes, ah, this is the mate for me, as opposed to all the animals. Great. Now, this is a much deeper and more bonded relationship than the selfish needs of a body. Through his search, Adam discovered his needs, his needs for a partner. He discovered his, that he's alone without her. And only then is he ready to feel whole, to be completed by the isha, by the woman. So it says here, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Let me explain what goes on in the Hebrew there. Okay, here we have four Hebrew words on the the right. You don't have to know how to read Hebrew for this, okay? Don't get intimidated. Not going to teach you how to read Hebrew, but just look at the letters you see up there. So that we have two words at the top of the, uh, the top word is the word for fire, And you see it's made up of two letters. You see them? It's pronounced ish. And then we have the word for man, which is ish. Okay, and you see the difference? You see there's that little, uh, short little letter in between the other two letters there? Okay, and then we have the word for woman, isha. And notice that the two letters, the letter that was added in the middle to make the word fire into man, and the word that was added to the word fire to make woman, are the name of God. Everyone see that? Okay. In other words, fire is creativity, but it's also destructive. It's passion, but it's also necessary for for constructive activity. Almost everything we see here that was manufactured by anything required heat and fire in order to make it. Fire is productivity and creativity, but again, it's also very destructive, depending on how it's used. The man and woman together are fire, creativity, passion, not creative ability, and passion with the name of God fused between them. That's the, you know, the Hebrew language is, uh, I often say that the Bible is written 
somewhat poetically. And what I mean by that, it's easy to misunderstand that. Let me make very clear what I mean, what I don't mean. I don't mean that it's all big metaphor. When I say poetically, I mean when you're reading a work of prose, like a, a newspaper article, a novel, a restaurant review, you're not looking for layers of meaning and multiple meanings in words. But if you're reading a poem, and there's a particular word chosen, or there's a, or there's a strange phrase, you look for, for like maybe nuances and multiple messages that might be coming through the same phrase. Because that's how poetry is written. The Bible's written that way. God will choose words or phrases that are a little awkward or strange. And you have to see all kinds of nuances. And you start to understand that there's, God can convey multiple lessons all at once. Right? So I don't want to frustrate you. Like you're going, oh, I don't know Hebrew. I'm missing all this. But uh, that's why I'm here. I'm here to help you out to see some of these beautiful truths. But that's really the relationship of man and woman. When they come together, they're bringing two parts of God's name together. And the ideal relationship, the fire of creativity, the fire of God, the fire of light and truth is all there in their relationship together with the name of God. Okay, moving on in the story, then comes the sin. We all know, we all know the scene. The woman, persuaded by the embodiment of evil itself, the snake, when she eats from the tree... It says there that she saw that the tree was good to eat and that it was desirous to the eyes. Now, it's important to focus on why she ate. It says, meaning, let me put it this way. The Bible could have said everything that the snake says to her. Because the snake says to her, you know, if you eat from the tree, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. And, you know, and, and, you'll, be able to, and you'll, be, you'll be really smart. That's his sales pitch. But the Bible doesn't just have her then eat. The Bible tells us her motivation for eating. And her motivation for eating is that the tree was good to eat and desirous to the eyes. In other words, she eats from the tree after the snake convinces her, but she doesn't eat from the tree because of the sales pitch that he gave. His sales pitch was, you're going to be smart, your eyes will open, you'll be like God. And she eats from the tree because it looks delicious. And it feeds her desire desirous for the eyes. The Hebrew word there is ta'ava hu la'inaim. Ta'ava is not just desire, it's lust. The Bible's speaking somewhat euphemistically. There's a lot of, there's a, she was giving in to physical material desire. She suddenly saw this delicious looking fruit and her mouth was watering and she wanted to eat from it. And she's overtaken by this desire and she eats and then it says that she gave it to her husband and he ate. There's no conversation there. Because when a woman offers up pleasure to a man, he usually just doesn't ask questions and goes for it. <laughs> That's the reality. She seduces the man to come along for the ride. In choosing desire over the will of God, the man and the woman affected their own relationship as well. They damaged their own relationship. And this is a key point. They're having a good time together. Hey, delicious, ooh, come along for the ride, ooh, party. We're going to enjoy this luscious fruit that, is, that, that caters to our lustful desires. But it harms their own relationship. Immediately, they're ashamed of their naked bodies. A shame is a terrible feeling. But it's a sign of something very good. Shame is actually, it gets a bad name. Shame is actually a really, really positive emotion. Let me explain what I mean. Shame is a sign of something very good inside of us. When we say about someone, that guy has no shame, we don't usually mean it as a compliment, do we? <laughs> you see, we feel shame. Listen carefully. This is another one. If you're spacing out, listen to this one. This is, this is a good uh, Sunday morning sermon. Here's what shame is. We feel shame when we've done something that we don't want to identify with. That's what shame is, right? So um, if I'm an honest person, I've never lied in my life, and then I lie. You ever do a sin for the first time? Don't put your hand up. <laughs> Look, you've never done something, a certain thing wrong, and then you do it wrong that one time for whatever reason you gave in or whatever. You feel terrible, right? And there's a sense of terrible shame that you have. What happens if you do it again? 
you feel a little less shame. And what happens if you do it again and again and again? You just stop feeling shame. What happened? So what happened is that as long as my behavior, if I do something negative, if I do something wrong, and I don't identify with it, I feel shame. So the gap between what I've done wrong and how I see myself is shame. Let me say that again. The gap between what I've done wrong and how I see myself, if there's a gap, again, if I'm a compulsive liar and I lie, there's no gap. So I don't feel shame. If I've never lied, there's this huge gap between what I've done when I lie that one time and how I see myself. So how I see myself and what I've done wrong. If there's a gap, I feel that's the shame. Which is why sometimes when people, uh, when people come into relationship with God later on in life, they often feel retroactive shame for things that they didn't feel ashamed for when they did them. Because at the time they did them, there was no gap between who, how they saw themselves and what they did. And now there is a gap, and they go, oh my gosh, I did that, and now they feel ashamed. That's what shame is. Shame is a very powerful emotion. So the fact that Adam and Eve feel ashamed is a good sign. Right? Shame means that what I've done does not express who I am or who I want to be or who I'm supposed to be. Animals have no shame in their nakedness. You know why? Because they are bodies. The reason that human beings are the only beings that wear clothing is because we are not bodies. It's as simple as that. We're not bodies, so we don't want to identify as bodies, so we, so we cover up those bodies, because that's not who I really am. We wear clothing. So man and woman are ashamed. Before the sin, they felt no shame in their bodies because their bodies weren't the source of any wrongdoing. The other kind of not feeling shame. The only, a person, if we say someone doesn't feel any shame, usually we don't mean it as a compliment. It means that they just identify as a sinful person. Someone's like a nudist and they walk around naked. They don't feel ashamed of their naked body because they're, that, they're immoral. The, other, the only other kind of person who doesn't feel any shame is literally someone who's never done anything wrong. So that's Adam and Eve before the sin. They, they didn't feel shame just because like, there was no reason to feel shame. They hadn't done anything wrong. They hadn't used their bodies for sin. But then as soon as they sin, their, their humanity causes them to feel ashamed of their bodies. They had given in to physical selfish desire by eating from the tree, which is natural behavior for animals. But they knew that that's not who they really are. And that, that that's not who they're meant to be. So the, and at that moment, the eternal struggle that we struggle with every day when we wake up, the struggle between body and soul was underway. Humanity's dual identity, body and soul, that struggle was apparent to them. And the shame that they felt in allowing their body to take the lead was now front and center. They identified with their bodies in that moment And that meant that their identity would go the way of all flesh. They would surely die as a result of their sin. Let's move ahead to the punishments given to this, to the first couple. To the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception in sorrow or pain. Really, the truth, the word is is etze, which means um, it's, it's sadness, but it's sadness that comes from pain. You shall bring, in sorrow, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he will govern you. Cursed is the, um, and then to the man, he says, cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Woman's punishment is pain and weakness during pregnancy and childbirth. That's her punishment. Man's punishment is that he will have to work very hard for his daily bread. So, why specifically these punishments? Why are these the appropriate punishments for this sin?
Man's punishment, again, is that um, he will have to work very hard. Doesn't seem, they're not getting the same punishment. There's difficulty in both, but they're not the same punishment. So I'd like to suggest that just as a loving father, a loving parent, loving father or mother uses punishments to educate and teach their children a lesson, that's why we punish our kids, God loves us. He loves humanity. He loved Adam and Eve. They are humanity. And God's punishments were meant to give man and woman the tools that they need to correct the damage that they had done, to learn from them, to move on. Now, why did man and woman eat from the tree? So let's see those verses again. So now we're going back to the actual scene of the sin. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God knows that on the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So as the woman saw that the tree, here is this. So the, so the snakes just made a sales pitch. Right? So look at it again. On the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's his sales pitch. And then it says, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was arousing to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise. That's secondary. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to the man with her and he ate. We don't know why he ate. He ate, like I said, he ate because, you know, this, uh, this attractive mate gave him some pleasure, so he took it. The sin was a sin of desire. That's the point. Woman followed the allure of sensory beauty and pleasure over the will of God. She gave into the urge of the moment. Then she seduced the man and he ate as well. Now let's take a look at verses 11 through 13. This is where God confronts Adam and Eve right after they eat from the tree. And so God confronts them. He says, Adam, where are you? Right? And Adam says, well, because they were hiding. Remember they were hiding? They heard God coming. God's like, where are you? And he says, well, I'm, in, I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed. And then God says to him, and he says, I'm ashamed because I'm naked. And God says to him, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, this is rich. The woman who you placed with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. I mean, a couple of verses ago, Adam was like, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. <laughs> and now he's like, that woman you gave me, it's her fault. Like, I don't even know her name. You know, like, oh, I know that woman. Like, you know, like, <laughs> I don't know what happened last night. I was drunk. You know, I, I don't know who she is. The woman you gave me, you gave her to me. You brought her here. Like, you know. Right? In other words, Adam says, you gave, he blames God and the woman. The woman you gave me, he's blaming both of them. And then the woman immediately blames the serpent. You know, we like to think of the, you know, Christians use the phrase original sin. Uh, there's multiple sins going on here. Okay, like there's, there's the sin of eating from the tree, and then there's this, and then there's this sin. The sin of, of not taking responsibility. And we can imagine that God's reaction, that the results of the sin might be different had Adam not reacted this way. But Adam basically says, let's sum up both of their responses to God in one simple sentence. Confronted by God, the man and the woman essentially have the same reaction. I am not responsible. And the punishments, ladies and gentlemen, are all about responsibility. When we want to teach our kids about responsibility, lesson number one is that there are consequences to our actions. So God says to the man and woman, you think that you can selfishly give in to your physical desires and walk away from responsibility? Here's what's going to happen. New rules. Woman, you forever after will now think twice before offering pleasures to man. You see, there are consequences to giving in to your physical urges. 
you may very well find yourself in a weakened and vulnerable state. You'll have pain. You'll be dependent. And most of all, you'll have the greatest of all responsibilities when all is said and done. All the results of giving in to the pleasures of the flesh and inviting your man to come along with you. Man, you will not be free to spend your days seeking sensory pleasures. You will have to work to feed yourself. Now, let's play this out even further. God's real smart. God is really smart. So, let's think about the results of this. Before inviting man to partake of physical pleasure, of the delicious fruit, the woman will now turn to the man and say, wait a second. Before we uh, enjoy this fruit, the stakes are pretty high for me, you know. So how will I know that you're going to be there when I'm weakened and suffering and in need of assistance? How do I know that you'll be there to help me with the results and the responsibilities that might emerge from this pleasure seeking? So now they sort of slam on the brakes and the man has to prove his commitment to her first. He has to build her trust before she offers the fruit to him. He has to show her that he'll be there long term. In other words, a relationship built around shared goals, and shared ideas, and an emotional connection. The spiritual side of the relationship, all of these things, must now come first. Then, after this courtship, after developing bonds that are not about the physical primarily, after building a shared vision of the future and a shared trust and commitment, then the physical pleasure relationship can begin. And we're not opposed to that. That's wonderful in the context of a loving and committed relationship. Man chose to put his body before his soul. Right? He chose a physical focus and physical desires and physical agenda over a spiritual one. So God's punishments are designed to incentivize the man and woman to build a relationship in which the spiritual bonds are built and in place before the physical relationship begins. The physical enjoyment is now going to be governed by and in the context of a spiritual relationship. How many times... Do we need to witness the damage done by relationships that are first built on physical things? By putting the spiritual before the physical, the man and the woman learn that the fundamental glue that binds a relationship is responsibility. Responsibility means that something is more important than me, that I serve, that I work, and I protect. It is just such a relationship that is tailor-made to produce and nurture life. Now, you may notice that I've been referring to this original couple as man and woman. I have yet to use the more familiar Adam and Eve. And this has been very deliberate, and here's why. At the very end of this passage, after the punishments are meted out, we then have this great verse that ends the whole passage. It says, and Adam called his wife's name Eve. She wasn't called that yet. She's not called that in the Bible until the end of this story. Because she was the mother of all living. The, the, the name Eve in Hebrew was Chava, which is from the root Chai, which means to live. Chava means the, the, the one who brings forth life. The mother of all living. Remember Adam naming all the animals? Remember how that started? Adam's naming everything. He's got one more thing to name. And he recognizes who she is, that this is the mate. This is the helper. This is who God sent him. But notice that she's only called the mother of all living things after the sin, after the punishments, after they learn about responsibility. Now we can understand because what God was saying to him, now that you understand responsibility, now you can be parents. How tragic and complicated it is when children enter the world through relationships built on irresponsibility. And there's a lot of those. Situations can be fixed. It's true. And many of us have dealt with them, I'm sure. I don't, I mean, it's a big world. 
But there's a lot of adjustment and a lot of pain along the way and a lot of lessons learned. And it can get worked out. But here in God's handbook for the world, in the Bible, we are told what is ideal. We are told what ought to be. Ladies and gentlemen, we always talk about the covenant of marriage. Beautiful phrase, covenant of marriage. What's a covenant? It's a nice word. It's a nice churchy word, covenant. What is a covenant? What does the word mean? So the Hebrew word for covenant is berit. Berit. It actually first appears in the story of Noah, in the aftermath of the flood, where God commands Noah regarding certain basic moral principles, and he commits himself to never destroy humanity again. At the simplest level, a covenant is an agreement between two sides. But if we look at the original Hebrew word, we'll see something much deeper, much, much more. The Hebrew word berit, which is the word in the middle of the, uh, of the page there, well, you see that in the English, it stems from the Hebrew root bara, which means to create. So a covenant is not merely an agreement between two sides, it's a partnership meant to create something new. When Abraham is chosen and told to circumcise himself, that's also called a berit, a covenant, because there's something new. He's refining his physical self to create something new. Only then do he and Sarah conceive a child. When the people of Israel receive the Torah on Mount Sinai, it's also called a berit, a covenant. An agreement has been made between them and God, one that will create something new. It'll elevate them and create something new. The Hebrew word bereshit is the first word of the Bible. The opening word of all the words of God we have. The opening utterance of God. The opening communication of God for us. The first word of the Bible is bereshit, which is translated in almost all translations as in the beginning. And I want, to, I want you to look at these words now. Just look at the visual here. The middle word on the page is the word berit. The bottom word on the page is the word fire, the word ish. You've seen that word before. Now look at that top word. It is the word for covenant with fire inside. That's creation as it's meant to be. That's God's creation. Notice that the creation story, the six days of creation, you may have noticed this when you read the Bible. It's, it starts with chaos. Everything was chaotic and unformed. And then we have the most orderly passage in the whole Bible. The six days of creation have this, this kind of rhythm and structure to them, which are conveying the fact that creation is about bringing order out of chaos. There, there's no force in the world, in the natural world, more chaotic than fire. But when fire is contained, it is the greatest tool for, for so many good things and for so much creativity. The word bereshit, in the beginning, God's creation, is the word covenant with fire inside. That's creation. Fire left uncontrolled and unbounded is destructive, just like Adam and Eve's passions. Fire bound up in a covenant, that's what we have. Fire bound up in a covenant, passion and desire, but enveloped and controlled by a covenantal bond, by a spiritual relationship. That's beautiful. That's the first word of the Bible. That's, that's creation. The covenant of marriage between man and woman, a love relationship in which the spiritual, the values, the shared faith, they are the framework. That's the covenant. And then there's passion and love and pleasure. That's fine. In the covenantal relationship, that is is the relationship that God wants us to pursue. That's the ideal relationship. That is a true covenant of marriage, and it's a relationship that can create in the same way that God creates. So folks, going back to where I started, we're at war. We're at war in many, many ways. The spiritual battles that we're fighting, that you were fighting in Austin, and the kinetic battles that we're fighting in the Gaza Strip, and in Lebanon, and with Iran, there in Israel, are all part of one war. Our enemies have told us that. Let me say that again. Our enemies have told us that. The same people on the side of all these issues 
<laughs> it's all the same people. And we better wake up and understand that it's all the same war. And we, each and every one of us must ask ourselves why we were chosen to be brought into this world at this time when everything seems to be coming to a head and what that demands of us. Folks, we need you. The Jewish people have a lot of strengths. But one thing we will never have is numbers. The Bible already says that we're the smallest of all peoples, the least of these, as it's, as it's referred to in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7, the least of all nations. That's who we are. Everyone thinks there's more Jews than there are because we make a lot of noise. <laughs> the Jewish people are less than half of 1% of the world's population. We're tiny. And we need you, not just because of the numbers. We need you for the spiritual strength. We need you because we're really in this together. We need you because Isaiah speaks of a time when the temple in Jerusalem will be a house of prayer for all nations. And Zechariah speaks of nations of the world. There are those among the nations who are trying to take the land of Israel away from us. And the book of Joel speaks of a judgment day for those who try to divide up God's land. And sure enough, it's in the headlines every day, people trying to divide up God's land. But the book of Zechariah, chapter 2, speaks of those among the nations who fight alongside Israel, who become part of Israel, who become part of God's people together with us. And yeah, we have our differences. As I once said, I'll tell you, I'll leave just one last anecdote and then I'll say goodbye. I was, uh, <laughs> I was having dinner once in Jerusalem with a group of, of, of Christian business leaders from the southeast. They were all from like the Carolinas and, and Alabama and that part of the country. And they'd been brought into Israel by uh, an organization that wanted to you know, educate them about Israel. And they invited me to speak to them, to speak to the group. And we were having dinner together before I spoke. And I'm sitting across the table from this, you know, this lovely Christian businessman from Alabama. And we're talking over dinner. And he's like, oh, wow, this is interesting. You're a rabbi. You, know, you don't believe what we believe, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, well, well, Rabbi, how do you interpret Isaiah 53? I said, well, we have a Jewish interpretation of it. It's different than the Christian interpretation. You know, I could share it with you. You know, so, so I, share, I share with him the Jewish interpretation of Isaiah 53. And he's like, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. And he was really uncomfortable. So I said to him, look. I said, you have your Christian understanding of Isaiah 53 and what it's referring to. We have our Jewish tradition of how to understand that passage. But, you know, there's a lot of people in the world right now who have never heard of Isaiah 53. They couldn't care less about Isaiah 53. They don't value Isaiah 53. They don't see it as the word of God. Why don't we agree that we're going to focus on defeating them? And when that's done, we can fight about Isaiah 53. <laughs> so that's where I'm coming from here today, folks. We have our differences. But we are, we are trying to build the kingdom of God. We are trying to bring... What God's dream to reality, that the kingdom of God exists here on this earth with all of us serving him together, shoulder to shoulder as one voice. And we, that's where we need to focus our energies right now. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, just a, a last things, I have, a, I have a podcast called the Shoulder to Shoulder Podcast, if you want to listen to it. It's me and a pastor, me and an evangelical pastor. We, we do this weekly podcast together. We talk about issues that matter to people of faith. We bring on guests. We talk about what's going on in Israel. You can find it on all podcast platforms, shoulder to shoulder. I also host a, uh, a TV show on the Real America's Voice Network, which is, uh, any of you ever heard of that network? It's the same network that has some other very popular shows like Steve Bannon's show and Charlie Kirk's show, and you can find it online. It's called Eyes on Israel, a weekly, a weekly show all about what's going on in Israel to educate people about that, a news program. And, uh, and I work for Israel 365, which is, uh, you look on our website, israel365.com, you'll learn a lot about what we do. And lastly, I have books out here. If you enjoyed this Bible teaching and you want more of my Bible teachings, I have some of my books out here with uh, more Bible teachings that I've done. And uh, it would be a great way to support what I do, to pick up one of the books on your way out. I'm happy to sign them. So thank you. God bless. Thank you, Pastor, for having me here. Rabbi Pesach Waliki, who just show some love again. Thank you so much.